All right, so welcome back everyone. Before we begin with anything, we have to understand the or underlying technology and that's that's the foundation is the internet. Whatever we are trying to protect that are that are mostly, mostly I would say 99% of the time is connected to the internet. All right, so uh, in order to protect that, we have to understand how it works. So the point is we need to understand how internet works, okay? So I'll try to keep it very, very simple so that you get the fundamentals really clear, right? We'll talk about the technologies later, but let's take an example and understand it, all right? So in order to understand the internet, the, the, the way the, we, we of course know, um, nowadays we can do anything over the internet. Maybe it's about sending some uh, profile pics, maybe it's about doing the inter shopping over the internet, or maybe it's about uh, doing some online transfer, money transfer over the internet as well, right? So for everything, we make use of internet. And everything that works on the internet uh, is works with the fundamental of packets. It's great, right? But let me give you an example and tell you how the packets comes into the picture. Right. So uh, suppose, uh, for example, you have a friend in uh, New York and um, you need a, a photograph of a cat. Maybe for any purpose, right? Uh, now this, this photograph of a cat, you need it and you are sitting in Tokyo, maybe. All right and you need this image right away. How exactly internet works is, uh, internet can't really transfer the entire image, entire photograph, entire picture of a cat directly straight away, right? What exactly it do, it, it, can, it can actually perform is, it has to split, it has to basically fragment the entire image into multiple, multiple sites, multiple, you know, multiple fragments. And that's what is gonna happen. It's gonna fragment at the source site, at the, uh, at the center side, at the center side, the the entire information will be fragmented into multiple parts, and this will be uh, put into a, a box, a kind of a, you know, a box, a kind of packet. You know. So this image will be there in the packet, and will be ready, right, ready to be transferred over the internet. Okay, and uh, internet is just a connectivity from one country to the other, from one city to the other, from one city to another city connected to a whole lot of fiber cables all the way from all the way from New York to Tokyo to European country to Asia everywhere you find it you see everywhere is the connectivity it's all because the fiber cables are built right so we are talking about the fundamental technology now this package uh, now this free uh, fragments sorry goes into the packet and now this packets are uh, are a sort of um, independent they are independent to find their way they can choose any way. They can go from New York to Tokyo by any means. They can find a route to any other country or any other route. Maybe it can go through Asia. Maybe directly go through the you know Tokyo or any other land. So let me give an uh, example. The first pack can choose the first uh, the topmost path. The second one can choose the even the other path as well. The third one can work according and the fourth as well. Now once it reaches on the destination side, that's where the magic happens. All these these fragmented, uh, you know, all these fragments basically, but the packet as well get reasoned. Okay, so that get reasonable on the destination side, on the receiving side. So that's where these these fragments get reasonable and pick up the actual image, the, the original image that was kept, yeah, right? And that's how you say your friend thanks, right? Now, now this entire stuff that just happened, it was. It happened very smoothly, but that's where the real technology resides. What do you see on the source side and the destination side? And that's what the TCP IP stack is all about. And this is the foundation of the internet. This is why the internet works so smooth. And you see on the bottom, there's a TCP IP, okay? That's basically a software suit. The software suit that's, uh, that's uh, basically it sits on your computer. That's actually installed on your computer. And I'll show you how that works as well. Uh, how you can configure that as well but remember this this tcp ip is the entire uh, protocol that responsible for doing the fragmentation and resembling on the other side as well that's how the data transfer that transfer over the internet of seamlessly all right so i hope you got the idea we'll catch you in the next session where we'll talk about osi layers and tcp ip as well all right welcome back everyone my name is Rishnish Gupta, and in this video we are going to learn about osi layer Okay, so let's begin. So let, before we start, uh, I'll tell you something. OSI layer is basically a framework. It's a framework or a set of rules or set of protocols, I would say, 
it says that any two devices who need to communicate with each other maybe on the internet they need to follow set of rules they need to have uh, these uh, layers into it these software you could say okay and um, this is important on both the side if one is talking on one layer the other half the other have to be on the same layer itself and that's what osi layer is all about okay so there are seven layers in osi that says about different characteristic and different layer so let's begin first layer is physical layer this is all about if two devices just want to be connected on the physical layer they they don't need any set of software or something they just have to be connected on the cable and that's what you could see maybe it could be a copper cable it could be a fiber cable any sort of cable if they just want to be on the physical layer they can just be connected right so that's what the physical layer is all about that's the first layer next is the data link layer data link layer is all about the layer 2 layer. It's, it's basically also called as layer 2 layer and this is where the uh, in a way if uh, the LAN communication basically happens, the local area communication this is where the discovery of each and every devices happens when I say discovery any devices which are connected physically other devices can detect it based on the data link layer in a way of LAN technology or Ethernet technology this is discovered uh, or I would say identified based on the MAC address so usually you might have heard about switches so switches are basically extends extend uh, your LAN network so if you want to have two computer right two computer want to talk to each other you just connect a LAN cable uh, from one computer to another they can talk to each other but what if there are five computers so what could you do you might, might you have to have five uh, ports on each computer and you have to connect to all of them that's going to be really messy just think about 100 computers in the office what would you do that's the solution and you can just have a switch and connect all you just have to have computers with just single port and they can all connect to the switch that's e easy right that's what the switch is and the moment any devices uh, is any device or any computer is up with the help of switches, with the help of data link layer or the layer 2, uh, the devices can be auto-discovered. That's happened because of Ethernet technology. And in the layer 2, basically every device is, every device is basically identified or uh, every communication happened based on the MAC address. And this MAC address is the physical address, just like uh, uh, every, every, uh, every, you know, uh, sort of every uh, every person has their physical identity like dna right that cannot be altered right there's the way we have our fingerprint that can't be altered right that's the way every device uh, has their burning address this, this address is given in the first place the device is formed in manufacturer or, or i would say so this is how it is being denoted 48 bit address uh, it's normally alphanumeric so that's what you whenever you see that mac address that's basically a layer 2 address that's how the communication works on the layer 2 data link layer all right so next comes is the network layer this is the logical layer basically uh, the way you have uh, everybody has their uh, identification which cannot be changed like as i said the dna fingerprint uh, network layer is just like your name right you can of course change your name right you can of course have different name on the different uh, maybe of course who do that but uh, but you can of course have the names right that's what the network layer is it's a layer 3 uh, where the communication happened based on the ip address right and um, where the transfer where the data transmission or transfer of a data happened based on the ip address uh, if if we have the ip address on both the side then only the communication could happen right and the device which do the transmission with the device which perform this transfer of data from one system to another one computer to another is called router remember this the switch which we talked about in the layer 2 it's basically responsible for forwarding the data on the layer 2 that's basically transferring uh, transferring the data based on the mac address whereas the uh, router is basically responsible for forwarding the data based on the ip address so that's where you see you know router even you at your home router whenever you need to change the settings or you need to change the uh maybe ssid of your home router or maybe change the password you always go to a browser and you know you usually may make use of 192.168.0.1 or maybe 1.1 as well 192.168.1.1 that's because the router is identified based on the ip address and of course router also identify other devices based on the ip address if if the device is not configured with the ip address it can't do anything router cannot do anything right so in, in order to in order for router to perform any sort of forwarding uh, the device need to have or the computer need to have an ip address and this ip address is usually 32-bit address 
Of course, there's folder, 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 folder is the Google IP address, but any system can have any IP address. Uh, usually, there is two set of IP address, private IP address and the public IP address. Private IP addresses anybody can assign uh, in their local area, but if you want to have communication outside uh, of your area, outside of your LAN, and you want to have access to the internet, you need a public IP address, right? And of course, you might be having a question that how, Rajneesh, how, how come I access to the internet while having the private IP address, uh, while having the private IP address? That's because your service provider do the job. Your service provider basically uh, hides your private IP address and then allow you to get access to the internet, all right? So you basically, uh, they basically rent their public IP address for you. Now let's begin. Uh, let's, sorry, let's uh, start. Um, next comes the transport layer. You see, that's what we, if you're following me, uh, if you have uh, checked my last video on the how internet works. So that's where I talked about TCP IP. This is, this is what which is responsible for doing the fragmentation and resembly on two computers from on both sense source and destination side. This is what which is being responsible for managing the socket, which is basically responsible for managing the application to application communication or um, port to port communication that's what we'll be talking about it in much more detail in the further session but for now just remember one thing tcp ip is the one which is responsible for doing the fragmentation and resembly as we talked about earlier we'll talk about the ports we'll talk about the sockets and some other jargons related to the t transport layer itself related to tcp ip itself all right next comes in is the of course this is the tcp ip and every every computer is be is will, will be having multiple application running into it and every application will be identified with a certain port number and that port uh, will be uh, will uh, you know can be of different range from starting from 1 to 65535 right and every port uh, identified the application okay so if we have 80 that identify then this this uh, you know this application is http means that it's running http services or maybe web application if it is uh, 443 that's the https application i'll talk about it if it's 25 that means that uh, computer or system is running a mail service smtp mainly okay um, then we have session layer now that's very really interesting session layer is the one which is responsible for uh, initiation of a session uh, management of a session and uh, basically termination of a session so that's responsible for uh, once the session has been established it, it is responsible for management of the entire session throughout throughout the you know flow of the packet right now the once the session has been established uh, once the session has been initiated or whatever it is and next is the presentation layer that's where a lot of other stuff happen based maybe we have encoding done maybe we have encryption uh, done end to end. That's what you see on the WhatsApp as well, right? Whenever you talk to your friend, you see uh, this this uh, communication is end to end encrypted. That means, um, uh, uh, besides from you and your friend, nobody else can see what's really happening. That's all because of encryption, and that's all happen on the presentation layer, right? So that's what it is. Yeah, uh, even the encoding as well. So there are multiple encoding that happens too. So that's it's being uh, that, that is being taken care of by presentation layer. Finally, we have application layer. Now, application layer is the one which is which user finally see. You know what you see at the end. You see a browser. You see the you know email coming in, text written, and everything. Whenever you go to a Google, you see Google Doodle. You see the response coming in. You see the YouTube. This is all application response, right? This is where the user actually interface. This is where user directly communicate, right? But whatever there on from the top to bottom, from presentation layer to physical. A user is not really directly you know interfacing with it right so user can understand can see whatever uh, presented on the application layer right so that's where you see your browser data that's what we call it SCTP uh, traffic you see your email coming in and you see the content into it that's what we call SCTP traffic as well what did you understand from this the purpose of this entire uh, method is basically to give you an idea that this entire entire framework, this entire framework has to be present on both the side. It means if two computers need to talk to each other, they they uh, both of them should have all the same layers, from physical to data link layer to network layer to transport layer to session layer to presentation layer and the application layer as well. If any of the any of the any of the session is not really working, the communication will not be successful. It won't really happen. That means this is, some, this is something which is really important. If you take it, uh, go back to the earlier video where we talked about the internet from your friend to you sitting in Tokyo, 
you know uh, it means both the source and the destination both uh, uh, both your friend sitting in the nyc and you at tokyo should have the osi seven layer all the seven layers of the os you got the point this is what we have to have on both the side if you don't have the OSI layer on both the side, the communication won't happen. And that's what I talked about, the, the fragmentation or resembly happening on the source and destination side. This all happened because of it. All right. So I hope you got the idea about how OSI layer works. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome back everyone, this is Rajneesh. And this session is about Ethernet switch. Now, let's understand. You have, you have got a computer. Every computer has got a port to connect to the internet. Well, NIC or Ethernet port okay I, that's where we connect the rj45 cable so that you can get access to the internet all right now let's say you have two computers okay and if you want to have a communication between both of them what could you do you can connect a cable uh, with computer a to computer b and you're good you can talk uh, you can have a communication between them you can share a file directly with the network share option and everything and it's going to work perfectly fine but just think about it if you have maybe uh, four computers maybe five ten computers what you would what you would do you just have one port on every computer all right if you just have one port how could you connect it to multiple multiple devices maybe 10 20 or hundreds of a computer just with one cable there's no way right but there's a solution that's what we call ethernet switch now ethernet is switch is something where you just have to connect your cable you you have your computer just connect your rg45 to this switch and all the computer just connect a cable to their computer and the next end to the other end to the switch now the switch allow communication among all of them directly just with their one cable isn't it really solving the need that's how we expand the network. Earlier, we were only able to have a communication between two computers. Now we can have a communication among maybe 10, 20, hundreds, or 50, 500 computers directly. That's all because of switches. And that's what works on the layer two. That's that's the, that's the that's what we talked about in the OSI layer as well, because switches allow communication on the layer two mode. That's where the switches, for that switches need the MAC address. And with the help of MAC addresses, each switches can recognize, okay, on which, by which on which cable which device is connected which computer is connected maybe it's a john computer oh yeah john computer is connected on port 2 oh this is uh, olivia i mean she's connected on uh, port 24 or maybe there's somebody else right this great who is connected to port 7 maybe there's david who is connected to ports uh, maybe 16 right so that's how switch understand okay it's port connected to port this port i need to if i need to forward the traffic to david this is where i can forward the traffic in between right so it expands the network help to accommodate a large network as well and this is how it would really looks like so let's say you have nine computers you just have to connect you know you just have to have nine cables connect the one end of the cable to the individual system and then other end straight to the switches and now all the computers can have a communication among them easily and that's how the switches really works and that's the purpose of the switch all right i hope you got the idea we'll catch you in the next session thank you all right, welcome back everyone. This is Rajmish and this session is about routers. What's the first thing that you do with the moment you decide to have internet connection, probably to your new home or the office? You go to the shop and ask for any router, right? And once you get it, you start to configure the username and passwords on the DSL or ADSL configuration, right? That you probably get it from your service provider, internet service provider, right? And that's what exactly happened with the router that's what the router purpose is the purpose of router is to connect your home devices with the external world that is the internet right and that's how the home router really looks like it could have two antenna four antenna depends on the, what kind of range you're looking for usually it could have two bands 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz right will not go into wi-fi in this session we'll be covering in the further session all right so Remember, the purpose of a router is to the router works on the layer three of the OSI layer. That means it's it works on the network layer. That means it forwards the day, it connects two different networks based on the IP address, and it identify each every uh, devices, desktop, laptop, mobile phone, anything by its IP address. So if the device don't have any IP address, you won't be able to communicate outside the world because. Uh, in order to have the communication possible, it's a job of router. A router needs the IP address, just like uh, switches need the MAC address to forward the information called frame, right? And of course, uh, the the 
it connects two networks, home network with the internet itself. And this is how the setup really looks like. This is what we have seen in the switches as well when we were learning about the switches. But the purpose of switch is still the same. It's, it's expand the network. So the way your team grows, so you might you might grow from two to maybe ten to hundred. In that case, you 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 would need hundreds of desktop. And in order to have access to all the desktop, you need the cables to be connected, the RJ45 or copper cable. And this has to be connected to switches, right? And that's why you need to expand. That's why you need multiple switches to accommodate all the users. Now, the switches can expand your internal network but it cannot allow the communication to the external world. For that, you need a router. And that's why you see the router just next to it. In some situation, you might need a broadband. It depends on kind of communication we have. Uh, there are optical modem coming in as well for fiber to the home FETH. In that case, it can be optimal optical modem, which converts your light optical signal to electrical signal. I mean, uh, electronic signal as well in the, in the form of digital signal. All right, so this is about the home of a home or small office setup. Let's understand how the enterprise network really looks like. Of course, so the, the way the home router or the office network need to have a communication with the external world, uh, the enterprise network also need to have the communication to the rest of the world. But what really changes? The, the, purpose of, uh, the purpose of the enterprise router, the foundation of router still remain the same. It's exactly the same. What really changes is, when you look at the small office or the home router, they need to just forward maybe a traffic of uh, 10 or maybe 20, 40, 50 users, right? That could be that could require a bandwidth of maybe uh, 50 Mbps to 60 Mbps. What if a large organization or headquarter maybe? In that situation, that could be 500 Mbps to maybe 700 Mbps of internet circuits, which require. In that case, our low-end router or this home office router won't be able to handle so much of a traffic. So in that situation, you need a robust router which can handle such huge traffic. So that's why the enterprise routers are really needed, which are made for this. And there are many leader, uh, there are many uh, uh, largest uh, uh, solution provider or the OEM available as well, Origin Equipment Manufacturer. Cisco is the leading player in the Cisco router. I mean, when it comes to the router manufacturing, there is Juniper as well. Cisco has got ISR, ASR series as well. And the earlier was the ISR series. Now it is the ASR series router, which could be 1000 series router itself. So it could have WAN circuits, different kind of a port supporting different, uh, supporting different capability as well. What kind of capability? So the, the it's, it's understand this, we use enterprise router when we need high capacity or high bandwidth to be handled. Also, we might need, uh, you know, uh, enterprise has got, got VoIP, uh, voice over IP, multiple VoIP phone and uh, video calling uh, in Cisco technologies called telepresence as well. Polycom for, for Polycom is one of the player which is being used for, uh, you know, video conference and all those facility. This is the application related requirement which happens on the user side. There has to be some interoperability or compatibility with the uh, router as well so that to prioritize the voice traffic over the normal data traffic. Why do you need to prioritize? Because if the if the device of the router cannot prioritize it, the exper experience of the user might be deteriorated. And then data can be forwarded maybe uh, seconds or a minute later. But if the uh, video or the voice traffic goes even a second delay, the user can feel the disturbance. That's why the jitter, that's why the delay latency really matters for video or the voice traffic. And that's why the router has to be built in such a way for enterprise network that it can support the voice and the video traffic. That's why we need features like QoS, DSCP marking, IP precedence features and everything, right? So that's what it is. And also uh, throughout the session, we'll be considering our own uh, sample network design. This, this is something which I uh, designed based on a simple network architecture for any enterprise network, which has server farm where the where the external applications will be stored inside your own organization that's what we call as dmz demilitarized, demilitarized zones and there's internal server farm where we have our internal servers for employees for hr crm erp system and everything also the user workstation as well and what you see in the orange that's basically a firewall which we will be talking in the further session what do you see in the cross center that's the router which connects the external world with our internal network 
All right. So this is all about the enterprise router and the small office router as well. In the next session, we'll be going with the demo of it. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. This is Rajneesh and this session is about firewalls. Before we understand this, let's let's take an example. In the in the in the in a, for a building, there is a security guard, right? Security person taking care of the building security or the premise security. What exactly it do? It it actually prevent any unauthorized access to the premise, right? Is that the purpose of it? Correct. So it uh, it basically prevent any unauthorized access. And how exactly it ensure that? For every entry, it ensures that who is coming and to whom he is meeting and what's the purpose of it and what time he is coming, all those information. And then of course the signature of it, right? So what exactly he's trying to fetch? The source, source the person, the destination to whom he is meeting and the purpose, the basically uh, maybe for the meeting, for uh, maybe for the webinar or sales pitch, anything, right? That's exactly the purpose of firewall when it comes to the network. Just like the security gate sits at the gate, firewall sits at the gate of your network. When I say gate, it sits on the network perimeter of your entire organization. So let me explain you in detail. So uh, this, uh, these are some of the, these are the firewall really looks like just to show you uh, how the firewall physically would look like. Of course, firewall can be, it's, at the end it's a software, it's a logic. So, but in order to support huge, you may ask why do we need the appliance if it's a software, right? So the answer is when you have an hardware running for some purpose, you can have a dedicated processes, dedicated resources like dedicated CPU, uh, memory, storage for specific activity, maybe for establishing the VPN encryption and many other stuff as well, right? So that's why you need the hardware in order to uh, deliver a better throughput for the services. And uh, these are some of the leading platform, including Cisco, Palo Alto, Checkpoint. These are the platform you, you would find in most of the top MNCs. Of course, there are many other as well. Uh, Vodigit is also one of the popular too. Let's get started. And uh, the firewall works from the layer four till layer seven. That means it start. It it works. Its its job starts. Its job starts at the layer four on the transport layer. That means it's uh, of the OSI layer. That means it's look at the TCP or UDP ports and can also look at the application as well. Remember the legacy firewall from the time the firewall was really built, it was usually looking at the transport layer. That means the ports and the IP addresses, right? And it recognizes the devices, users based on the IP address, port, application, and many more. This is what I'm talking about the current or the legacy firewall appliance. Uh, the purpose is of course, is to protect the network from any unauthorized access. Uh, can you be correlated with any other stuff that we talked earlier? You got me right. That's the confidentiality of the CIA trial. If you remember, I talked about CIA and that C represents the preventing any unauthorized disclosure. That means it can be achieved by having access control. So whenever you uh, have, uh, have a prevention from any unauthorized access, you get basically better confidentiality. And that's why firewall is really, really important to achieve your confidentiality or the C in your cybersecurity goal, right? So you're getting the point in order to achieve the, your confidentiality goal, you need a lot of solutions. It's not the one shop, one solution that can take care of anything, everything. In fact, you need multiple solutions to take care of it. And firewall is one of them. And it's the basic need whenever the organization security is really discussed about. Next is firewall administrator. The, the way I talked about the, the purpose of security guard is to ensure uh, or to prevent any unauthorized access. The way it do is it makes a diary or maybe a software where it makes an entry of, of a person, meeting to which person, which person and the purpose of it. Similarly, the firewall administrator makes a security rules on the firewall about uh, which traffic, which kind of a traffic would be allowed and which kind of traffic would be denied, right? So let's look at how the security rule really looks like. If you remember, I talked about the sample network design. So this is how the design really looks like. The DMZ, where the com customer application would be stored, maybe web application, FTP server, email server, e-commerce servers. When I say customer, it's not really a customer, it's just that anybody who want to access my application from the internet, right, sitting from the home. In that case, they can access the application directly from the internet, come to the internet router, then the firewalls, and then to the DMZ network. 
what you see on the down which is the internal server farm this is the employee related server so people who want to access it uh, the access these applications sitting in my own corporate network they don't really have to go out they can straight away get access to it internally right so that's why the dmz is being named because that's where it's very risky if somebody get can get into the dmz network and possibly can compromise the firewall by any tweak or something they can get into the internal server farm as well and that's why the external dmz firewall or the dmz network is to be restricted and has to be taken care of care of it very seriously so how the security rule really looks like if you see the this is the checkpoint uh, dashboard where we create the fire, firewall rules you need to specify the name of the security rules then the source uh, from where the traffic would be initiated it could be the ip address it could be object having the name which resembles to the ip address or the group of ip address or the network of of uh, any network itself of ip address and then destination which servers the user want to have the access to and then service so service could be what service is the purpose in case of a real example service would be tcp and um, maybe any random port maybe http ftp or it could be smtp it could be ad443 any sort of stuff right it could be rdp as well for taking the remote desktop and then we can have action to be allow or drop accept or deny and we can have a track option enable as well so that any any new hit come to this rule we should get a log of it we should get an event to the firewall so that we can investigate and go back and you know can can perform any forensic what went wrong and other stuff so this is how the dashboard really looks like in case of generic firewall any other firewall you would also need to define the source zone and destination zone as well maybe internal to external external to internal all those stuff these belongs to the zone and what do you need in order to create the rules so i hope you got the idea so far you need the source address then you need the destination address then you need the service ports and that's where you define the tcp udp port and based on the ccp number itself the service would be defined as i told you 8443 these are well known rdp as well for remote desktop in case of windows too i hope you got the idea so far about how the firewalls and firewall rule, the rules really looks like in the next session we'll understand the difference between the legacy firewalls and the next generation firewall thank you so much welcome back everyone this is rajneesh and this session is about next generation firewalls you got me right there's a new boy in the town this is about next generation firewalls what we have just learned it was majorly about legacy firewalls and i'll just tell you about the difference uh, well uh, the picture what i am showing you over here it's uh, it means that the next generation firewall is built of a lot of features these are more of application i mean more of software related features but in order to support those dedicated software features there are some hardware uh, daughter board cards available as well just like you you see in the in the computer people who works on the graphic designing or you know kids who are interested about gaming they go for graphic cards right what's the purpose of it just to provide additional cpu right just to provide better uh, processing enhance the processing capability similar to that with the next generation firewall there are many such features in order to support those application that is need to have some additional hardware resources which are having dedicated cpus uh, then uh, memories and everything right so that's the purpose of it so what do you see on the left that's basically the legacy firewalls and let me tell you the difference the the way the legacy firewall take actions the way the legacy if i talk about the uh, security guard take action is based on couple three parameters in, in fact where are you coming from the way security guard asks the guy right where are you coming from that's his source where where you want to go that's the destination and what ports are you talking on the purpose of your meeting so these are the three things which which is needed to which is needed for legacy firewall which basically legacy firewall ask for any kind of a traffic or request coming into it right when it comes to the next generation firewall it takes the action based on some more parameters so of course the first is the where are you coming from that's the source then where you want to go that's the destination and then this comes the purpose which what ports you are talking on right and then it asks something more are you really talking on this port well this is something which is uh, even more smarter way what was really changed in the past in the past 7 uh, or 8 years is that the way the threat has been changed threat landscape in fact has been changed what has been done is uh, earlier we can we can allow the traffic like http https or 
DNS to be like genuine traffic. But what really started happening is uh, cyber attackers, the threat actors started encapsulating the malicious traffic inside the genuine ports, inside the whitelisted ports like HTTP, DNS traffic and all those stuff. In that situation, legacy firewall things think of it like, okay, it's a, it's a genuine uh, ports and everything. I should really allow it. But when it comes to the next generation firewall, it makes a database of all kind of application. Maybe it's a Skype, maybe it's a traffic for Microsoft RDP, maybe it's a, uh, any sort of Oracle application, maybe it's a Salesforce, SAP, uh, it it's can be for related any stuff, it can be any application in the world, right? It can be millions of applications. And Next Generation Firewall keeps the database of all those applications. So if somebody says, okay, I want to talk on port 80. So it's try to understand, are you really talking on port 80? So it try to even take the signatures of those traffic and try to understand, okay, this is the really the port 80 and this is the kind of application which is going into it, right? So um, let me give you an idea, specifically in terms of firewall. So legacy firewall uh, needs uh, identify based on source IP address, right? Destination IP address, port and services. Next generation firewall, uh, it's basically where are you coming from? You remember that source IP address, destination IP address, ports and services. And when it comes to identifying, are you really talking on this port? That's where the application ID comes into the picture. For every application, it keeps a database, as I told you. And that's where you try to match if you are, you, if you're, if you're really having Skype going on port 80 or something else, or you know, accordingly, it get the idea and it makes any evasion of application in those situations. User ID as well. So user ID is mapping the user so you can specify which user should be allowed for which application uh, to which destination and all the stuff. And there are content ID as well for better signature identification and identify any malicious pattern into the traffic as well. But this is not limited to this. The next generation firewalls have got much more capability as well. All right, so we'll see in the next session where we'll be going into the practical demonstration of it. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. This is Rashmish and this session is about ping. You heard me right. Ping is the really the coolest feature of networking, or I would say the most often often used feature, uh, majorly by uh, network admin. It could be by the network operations teams. In fact, even by the normal user as well. Okay, so let me tell you what exactly it is. Most of you might be knowing it already. So the purpose of, uh, this is how you can do it on your command prompt. You just have to type a command ping and you can just ping anybody. What exactly it gives you is the, is the, is the verification that the uh, destination is reachable, all right? But this is not, the feature of ping is not just limited to that. I'll tell you in much more detail. Uh, the purpose, of course, I told you, it's a troubleshooting starts with ping command. I mean, um, for most of the folks, troubleshooting actually starts from ping command. If they, if somebody user says, okay, I have a slowness issue. Hey, listen, this application is not working for me. Hey, listen, uh, the, I have a intermittent loss of communications. I can't reach out to the server for a while. Uh, many stuff, right? You can just try pinging it, okay? And if you see, there, the, if, if you see in the command, in the output, there are four packets has been sent. Each line represent up uh, 32 bytes of a packet which has been sent, and there's a time which has been mentioned of five milliseconds. Uh, that's being taken. Uh, that's the time duration which it gives you the idea as well. But what is really important is you can increase the number of time, or you can make it for infinite as well. It can be a loop as well. So in that situation, you can get the idea, okay, if there's really a packet drop in this situation or not, and how much time it takes the packets to go to the destination and comes back. Okay, that's the round trip time. It's a network command to check if the IP address or the host is accessible or not. So if I, I just turn up a new service, I just want to verify if my service is up or accessible for everyone, I can just ping the server or the IP address or the host IP address itself, right? And that would be pretty easier. It uses ICMP message. And from the context of OSI layer, which exa where exactly it's going to work, you heard me right? Because we are all talking about IP address, so it is supposed to work on network layer. And that's right, it works on the network layer and hence the ICMP works, and ICMP messages also works on the uh, messages, also works on the network layer as well. Because it will help you out to get the information at the network layer. But it is not sure what is the reachability on about that. Maybe on transport layer, if ping is not sure about it. On the session layer, ping is not sure about it. Not even in the application layer, if the application is working or not. You can only verify till the network layer if the reachability is good or not. 
right? For troubleshooting on the further layer to the other side of the layer, you can you can start using any other commands for this. This is the extensive command. You start with ping minus D minus A minus N number of counts, number of packets that you want to keep sending it. So you can be very extensive. In the next session, we'll have a lab and we'll keep making we'll be making use of this command to perform some extensive diagnosis or troubleshooting, right? So thank you so much. We'll catch you then. All right, everyone, this is Rajneesh and this session is about how trace route works. Let's get started. So this is what happened when you go on your command prompt, type CMD, and um, you want to trace out to any website, any host. This is how it really looks like. But before that, let's understand what exactly trace route is. So after ping, this is the most coolest tool available for network admin and operation folks. Everyone who is into troubleshooting break fix, all those stuff, they know this command very well and this has a huge and tremendous value for troubleshooting. It's a critical tool for network troubleshooting. It's a network command to check the end-to-end -end path to know basically the path. If you want to troubleshoot the uh, challenges across the path, you should know what is the path, right? And that's where Trust Route really help you out. Still remember one thing, Trust Route also works on the layer three, the network layer of the OSI model. Okay, so whatever we have just discussed, this is all about OSI network layer. So when you somebody asks you to troubleshoot, even even if you are a network architect, anybody, if you have started, you know, deployment, you have deployed a network with routers such as firewall, load balancer, proxy servers, a van accelerator, any n number of stuff. Now you want to see how the traffic really going across. Is the firewall coming in between? If the router is coming in between, is it is it, is it going by one path and coming back by a different path? that comes to the asymmetric routing issue as well. This all can be fixed and uh, um, in fact, first identified with trust route command, okay? Trust route is basically a feature. Command could vary for Windows, the command is trust RT. For Cisco router, it could be trust route. Juniper, it could be trust route as well. Depends, the command name would changes, but the, it works exactly the same way, right? It's again ICMP message. It makes use of ICMP message, UDP but it works on the uh, uh, network layer as well. Uh, uh, that's why it is, it, it, is, it is working on the you know, layer three of it. The command on the windows is this, you can ping to ping the, this command to RT and the IP address of it. I made use of example.com in the picture. In the next session, we'll talk a bit more about making use of, uh, of the demonstration of how Tracer works in the lab. Thank you so much, we'll catch you then. All right, welcome back everyone. This is Rajneesh and this session is about DNS. Well, if I tell you uh, that I just made a website and um, to, to access my website, just go to your browser and type 104.21.51.151. You heard me right. This is my website. You can go and type once. But will you really remember tomorrow or maybe day after tomorrow or maybe after a month or maybe after a year? Not really, correct? So that's a challenge. Remembering a website just with its name of 32 bit can make your life a bit difficult, right? Just imagine if you have to log into maybe hundreds or thousands of a website in a month, how would you remember your favorite website, right? Isn't it really difficult? And what if the website IP address keep changing if the way they start hosting their website on multiple platform? they move from one hosting to another server another server to another server the ip address might change what would you do the solution is dns you heard me right this is what you really look it really looks like when you you know try to get the information about a name of a website uh against uh ip of a website against the name of the website okay i'll tell you in detail but let's first get the basics done of the devices on the internet communicate with IP addresses. And, but you don't have to remember that, right? Because you only need to remember the name of the site. Remember, as of now, we have learned that everything that happened on the OSI layer, that happens based on either MAC address, IP address, sport communication, and at the end, that's just the application. So you got the idea, there's no, no way somebody can just make their own website and all the world, everyone in the world can really remember that, right? Uh, so there's a way of to doing that. The DNS is the way. DNS maintain a database and then broadcast it to everyone, right? So what happened is DNS maintains a database of IP address to its corresponding name, 
and it helps everyone to perform the lookup. So you just have to remember the name of the website, right? Maybe your name, maybe your name.com, maybe your name.me, right? So with that, you can quickly type, just, you just have to tell your friend, okay, hey, go ahead and type maybe, uh, maybe your name.com and you go ahead and type this name and they they are ready to go you don't you, they don't really have to remember the ip address of this right because that headache has been taken care of by dns right that's basically take care of the database but w i wonder if i type the name who is basically doing the conversion how my computer knows what's the ip address of that system because my computer has got the tcp ip right as i told you earlier all the computer all the system who need to communicate to the internet need to have tcp ip software and in order for tcp ip to understand uh, where to send the message it needs the ip address so in that way my system itself should be able to get the ip address right against the name of the website the moment you hit it on the browser so my system need to go and get the look up somewhere and get the ip address against the website name that you just typed right so there are in that context there are two kind of dns services authoritative dns services and recursive dns services authoritative dns services is the one which is the main uh, is the ultimate uh, owner of that website or maybe of that name who holds the name to the ip address lookup recursive is the one which is the mediocre okay i'll tell you how that works authoritative dns has the final and the ultimate authority over dns over your domain or maybe the website name itself and responsible for answering the dns query from the recursive dns servers so what exactly is dns uh, recursive dns it could be your service provider internet service provider right so the moment you get your internet setup ready you just configure that on the system right you just configure uh, the uh, most of the time we configure the dns name as our service provider uh, so given by the service provider or most of us usually prefer the free dns service provider which is 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 which is provided by google right so what happened is the moment you hit let's say google.com my computer needs the ip address of google.com in order to forward the packet because remember computer has got tcp ip and it can only uh, perform the uh, communication if it has the ip address so it first comes from the user machine the system the tcp ip on my laptop goes and try to get the uh, ip address against the google.com the first server it reaches is your service provider which in, in in this in the normal in the generic world it's called the recursive dns server in that situation it goes to the root first the dot com the dot basically the directory and the root is the one which is the parent of all the domain and from there it reaches to the dot com and from there it reaches to the google.com which is the authoritative dns server who is the owner of that domain which which basically knows what is the mapping of this domain with the corresponding IP address, right? So in our example, it is example.com and this is the IP address against it. And that's how the request then comes back to the user. Once it gets the answer, the request comes back to the user and your system is ready to go. Now the TCP IP knows the IP address and it is ready to forward the packets to the destination as well. Right, so recursive DNS service is usually provided by internet service provider. Oh, that's twice. Anyways, I hope you got the idea. And um, uh, this is all about how the DNS really works. Uh, in the in the next session, I'll show you how we can uh, get more insight about DNS and much more cool stuff related to DNS as well. Thank you. All right, so thanks for watching this video. If you like this video and my effort as well, then you can subscribe to the channel. You can hit the like button and you can ask me any question in the comment section as well. Till then, keep learning.